This is Chippa Khan, and welcome to the uh, Otherworldly, the Changing Times, Changing Worlds uh, show for Wednesdays, where we give you a taste of what's going to be happening at the conference this November. Uh, if it's about supernatural, paranormal, metaphysical, occult, we figure it's time to bring it out of the shadows and share it here. Uh, tonight, uh, my guest is uh, Ashley, uh, who is going to be talking about a uh, what happens when you're uh, when you have to figure it all out yourself. Uh, <laughs> she said she said this on, on being a solitary, and I think a lot of us are in that category. Uh, she began her quest as a solitary in 1969 uh, in her teens, but she. Uh, in the Bible Belt, had an evangelical upbringing, and then dipped into the you know, the information that was available, probably very sparsely in that area. <laughs> and well, uh, yeah. it's a fascinating story, so I think I should let her tell it rather than me. Uh, so, Ash Ashley. Okay, well, you, I was raised Southern Baptist. Um, by the time I was in my early teens, I did realize I was different. I did not accept the whole Christian Baptist and thing. And I went, oh, where do I go from here? And, you know, it was, it was, it was kind of a, hmm. And then I, I also realized very early on that I was getting inputs that weren't just from people next to me talking to me. And so there was, either, whether it was ESP or just some sort of insight, whatever it was, I was going in a different direction. And actually the funniest part was my, my invisible friend, Herman, who presented himself in my four, in fourth grade when I was being bullied by some of the, you know, the, the high status kids, the cool kids. And the Herman would just say, okay, you need to fight back. You need to do this stuff and tell me. And, and Herman was always there. And then I finally realized many years later, after I was an adult, Herman equals Hermes. <laughs> ah. Yeah. <laughs> so then, and also about the same time in about fourth grade, when they first introduced us to mythology, all the girls in the class, they wanted to be Aphrodite. They thought that, oh, it'd be so wonderful to be beautiful and the goddess of love. I thought Athena was pretty cool with uh, law, yeah, with um, law, war, fiber arts. Yeah, <laughs> so I kind of got tagged early on that way. But um, I was finding things that I just knew I didn't fit where I was being raised. And when I got in, when I, in 1969 or about 1968, 69, I started realizing there was this other path. And there are psychic phenomena, I knew that because I could do things. I could play, play jokes, thanks to what Herman had taught me. On the kids that bullied me, if I sat in the back of the class, I could just sit back and focus on them and say, I'm going to make them stand up and go, ow, for no good reason. Yes, I know. That's not something that's ethical you wouldn't teach somebody to do, but <laughs> it, was, it was very entertaining at the time. And I got my revenge on a few occasions that way. You saw um, that that scene in her, in Practical Magic. <laughs> really? I, was that okay? Anyway, I did this in 1969. Well, that was it, it was at the um, the uh, PTA meeting. That, that oh, that awesome. one, yes. <laughs> Sounds so I had done like, or make them turn around and you know I could do that, <laughs> and I realized okay, there's something that's different than what they teach us in the background I was raised in, and. Unfortunately, somehow it got tagged to me and I became known as the, quote, witch, the town witch. When you're 14 years old and you're the town witch and the pastor of the mega church, the Baptist Tabernacle, who the guy shows himself with wheelbarrows of cash he's collected every Sunday, printed in the newspaper the next week in his ad, has a five minute broadcast on the radio station, on the you know, popular radio station every morning. And I think I was probably his topic of evil uh, at least one day a week for about two years. And when really? you're 14, 15, yeah. 
<laughs> oh yeah. And every I'd go into homeroom in school and they go, RJ was talking about you again this morning. Did you hear it? <laughs> so that was a very thing. And in a Baptist town, you really <laughs> so I was in a very peculiar place, um, trying to find my way with no information. And as I said in the intro. Uh, my aunt was sharing her astrology magazine, horoscope magazines with my mother. And I found this little ad for a cult book club. Well, you got to weed through the garbage in there because uh, you found all kinds of stuff. Some things were useful. Yes, you got some um, you got some Gardnerian stuff. You got some Civil Leak books. And of course, Dick Cavett introduced me to Civil Leak um, back then. And then but you also got things in the books like. Um, uh, was it Malleus Maleficarum? That was not particularly helpful or useful, but it was very <laughs> interesting and very scary. <laughs> not really very encouraging either. No, but I just went, okay, yeah, this is why I don't need to get labeled by R.J. Barber. <laughs> but so, but then I, you know, I got out and I started finding some fiction books that said, oh, casting a circle, the elements, and putting it together with what I read from the other things and. That's how I started on my path. I had lots of starts and stops over many years, but never found, never found other openly professed witches until 2006. That's a long time. Yeah. And I had been in the DC area since 1980, but I just never, and I looked, but I just could never find them. So it was very bizarre. So I think, you know, in a way, maybe maybe part of my task for this incarnation was find your own path and do it yourself and don't rely on others. You mentioned uh, Sybil Leake's Diary of a Witch uh, mm -hmm. and the occult book club. Do you remember any of the other books that you re you read as a young person? Yeah, there were there were you know, there were there was Gardner's classic, whatever. I can't remember the name. Yeah, um, yeah, well, yeah. The, okay. the, the witchcraft yeah. garden. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I can't remember many of the other titles there. There were a bunch of them and I, I collected them. Yes. Most, a lot of my allowance went to that. Yeah. <laughs> and I did, I found the novels, uh, the, the, some of the ones that I found very bizarrely were most helpful in helping me structure a ritual that worked for me and do some of the mechanics of things. Because Gardner didn't always give you all the mechanics. He gave you some, but mm -hmm. it was when I read back, I guess it was probably like 1972, I found uh, there was an a, a fantasy author, Catherine Kurtz. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Who Christianized it very nicely, but she gave you a very nice layout. And I went, got it. <laughs> yep. For creating ritual as opposed to just doing magic on the fly. It's a, it's a good, uh, I, I loved her stuff. So, yeah. So the other uh, the good, the St. Camber stuff I loved. <laughs> so that, that was part of that. I didn't know if anybody here would have ever heard of that, but anyway, yeah, actually I'm old enough. So <laughs> <laughs> we all, are, well, a lot of us here are, I I'm guessing. So yeah. and one thing I would say, you know, I mean, how many people here are solitaries at this point? Sort of. Uh, Bill and I kind of practice together, but. And I, I just count. realized some of the first books I read on witchcraft were actually children's fiction books. Yes. Zofa Keatley Snyder books and Jennifer Hecate Macbeth, William McKinley and me, Elizabeth. <laughs> and other titles yeah. like that. I like Star I Wars comments. Semi-solitary. Um, I was completely yeah. solitary. But then one of the questions, things I realized is I think the ultimate solitary practice is the one where you don't even realize you're a witch. You know, you're off on your own doing these things. And I've opened up a lot through Jen by coming to these meetings and realizing, oh, that's what all that other crap is over there that I've never understood. And... I still, it's solitary in the sense that she has her very specific path and I have mine. And they overlap and a little. They overlap a little, but not a whole lot. 
So. And yeah, that's another thing. I mean, did most people start as solitaries or did you start with a, a group or a coven and go, wait a minute, this doesn't quite fit me and go find your own path? Well, I've always thought that basically you get a, um, people don't convert to witchcraft as much as they realize that that's a word that describes their practice. Uh, it's more of a realization or recognition than it is a conversion because you're just doing what you do because you're living the way that you feel you should live. And uh, I don't think it's, I, I think I'm going to become a witch is not something I think most of us do. It's like, oh, gee, everybody's been telling me I'm a witch for a long time. Yeah. Uh, depending on the definition, I guess maybe I am. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of like my experience was. I, I mean, I realized it very quickly. I went, yeah, I think I am. But how do, how do I make it happen? Do I have to do it myself or do I find a group? And I spent many years looking for others who could teach me or a group to practice with. Because yeah, having read Gardner, oh, you need a coven. No, you don't. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is indeed the the issue that was going on, especially in the late sixties and early seventies. Uh, it was all about the lineage, and you had you can't be a witch on your own. You, there's no self initiation except in books, and in books you can do self initiation. But then, who so, was the first? Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Ms. B T W witch. Who was the first witch, and how, who taught that first witch? And they, they usually get really mad at you when you ask them that question. <laughs> well, I mean, I, like actually, I actually had an experience with a local HPS3 in a Gardnerian tradition who was very proud of her lineage, who I had to interact with on a regular basis. And she found out that I was a witch. And then when she found out I was a solitary and was not a member of an initiated in a Gardnerian line, um, um actually told one of her kids to deal with me when I asked the kid, no, you have to close the gate when you come through so the sheep don't get out. She goes, my mom says, I don't have to listen to anything you say because you're just a witch wannabe. Getting that from an 11 year old kid? Well, if the mother had said that, it's good that you found out. Found out. And yeah. I did, and I promptly decided that I was gonna remove <laughs> Disconnect as much as possible. Except my, my, little story, my, my little story like that was uh, we went to all the magazines mm -hmm. and we looked for, we were looking for community and I found somebody who only lived, you know, 20 miles away. And I, so we went to, we called on the phone. We made, arranged a visit. We went to visit her and we said, well, um, do you, do, should we, um, I know it's the night of the full moon, so you probably want to be doing something. And she said, well, excuse me, and left us in the living room. And an hour and a half, two hours later, she popped back out. She clearly had not known that it was the full moon. <laughs> and so she left her guests in the living room and went in to do whatever her little freaking devotional was. And we said, well, I'm not, I don't care what group she's in. I am not interested in it because hospitality is more important to me uh, than that was. And so that was that, but yeah, they're searching for others, big difficulty. And especially when they had that very strong concept of secrecy and lineage. Um, yeah, and you know, and you see this whole thing about oath breakers and okay, that, that's the thing. But then I've also found a lot of times when you've developed on your own over decades, as most of us have, you've got your own practice and what you're comfortable with and adjusting to other people's structures on a regular basis just doesn't feel very good. Yeah. And it's kind of the thing that even outside witchcraft in my own practice, which has been Zen Buddhism for a good long time, there are still the three treasures of Buddhism. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. And I take refuge in the Sangha. The Sangha is the religious community. I've never had a Sangha. And I have always struggled with the concept, you know, is can you be a real Buddhist or Zen Buddhist if you work entirely on your own and only 
have teachers through books and videos and things. And of course, it, you talk about lineages. Um, I have a wonderful book called The Experience of Zen, best history of it ever. And it pointed out the fact that one of the things that marks Buddhism and Zen in particular is apparently the Chinese obsession of having noteworthy ancestors. And every time somebody mentions Gardner, I think about that because, you know, he's not Chinese, is he? Or wasn't? <laughs> but, but he has that attitude that you're nothing if you don't come from somebody. Yeah. And, and, I, and that's right back to that first one of, you know, well, who was the first one who taught them? But yeah, this, this business of community or not. And in a very diverse sense, I have a sangha now because you are all my sangha. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I don't know if anybody else here is Zen, but. Well, this, this, is a good, um, this is a good time to ask. Aisling asked once, but I just noticed the reaction button at the bottom of the screen. If you if if you're currently or have been hit hit the um the reaction uh, raise your hand thing uh, I guess it's a I've got a thumbs up thing so that we can see how many of us are are solitaries here. Oh, okay. There's that. Obviously, I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, and I think and we find our community yeah. differently. I, I, I'm not sure how to take those down, but there they go. I guess they go. Oh, you also. click on it again. You click on it again and it goes away. And it goes away. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. I was just curious because. And, um, you know, one of the other issues with having, if you've been on your own and developed yourself as a solitary, no, you have wait. your own concept of deity or of the structure, and it may not fit with the community groups you run into. I mean, you get huge community groups, something like the earth spirit that lots of us are familiar with, that where they accept a lot of different traditions and concepts. Or, but if you're dealing with a local group that is has a very structured approach, you just don't fit. They insist that it's a nameless God and goddess. Oh, or they insist that you must use Greek pantheon or they, and whatever works, or you can't mix them. And oh God. I like it hear what people think about, you know, mixing pantheons, because I have, I have an altar up there that has deities from multiple pantheons all over it. And you know what? I've never noticed any disharmony up there. Yeah. I, I, I hit that when I discovered the heathens. I, I work closely with Thor, but uh, when I found a bunch of other heathens, that, oh, this is wonderful. Uh, and they told me, well, you can't hang around with Osiris and Apollo and Athena. And uh, it's like, excuse me, I don't let anyone tell me who I can have for friends. And I certainly don't tell any let anyone tell me who I can have for gods. And I was just, that, that was yeah. offensive to me. But, well, but yeah, some of them I, wanted to go for a kind of racial purity thing. Right. And which I, one up with which I will not put. <laughs> up with which I will not put. Yeah. And I I work from a basis that when, you know, I love it. So do you believe in God? Well, no, I don't believe in God. I know that God exists. And then we get into the hairy discussion where, well, you know, it doesn't matter what you are doing. All manifest deities are avatars of the one true God. And it's God's way of appearing to everybody in the form that is best for them at the time. And that explains all of the gods. So why shouldn't I accept them all? And that's one of the things that I had on my list is um, what is your construct? Do you say that, well, there are different pantheons or do you just go, they're, diff they're all different individual aspects of yes. the overarching deity and whichever one you need at the time is the mm -hmm. one you're going to be working with. And some people go, no, I'm going to confine myself to this pantheon and this. So, yeah, I'd like to see kind of how people, I mean, obviously, uh, Griffin, if you and me are pretty much on the same page in that. Oh, but we how, absolutely are. Uh, oh, yeah. I uh, personally have connections to Kuan Yin and 
to Thor, obviously, and uh, I forget who else I've talked with over over the years. <laughs> Mother Hola. <laughs> I've had quite a few. Not oh, actually, no. uh, Janine Marie has her hand raised. Yes. Hi. So um, I consider myself a witch and a heathen, but I'm a polytheist first and foremost. Mm -hmm. I had given myself to the goddess Diana, who mm. owns my butt, as it were. Um, <clears throat> I was born a powerful witch. And as I learned more about witchcraft, I gained vocabulary for my practice mm. but I, at one point as priestess I needed to choose a spiritual path in order to minister to people so um mm. and that is where I came through heathenry Thor came and got me so um many many hats right and many gods and goddesses so I try to express that as a polytheist or a spirit worker um, and as Tripacon mentioned earlier, um, you know, I don't hang out in circles where all my friends aren't welcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And the same here. And now another thing, well, yeah, we've got plenty of time. So looking at one of the things I found, um, obviously, you know, we've all dealt with some negative feedback from established traditions or covens, but and then, you know, obviously we've developed our own rituals. And so we may or may not feel comfortable in some very rigid rituals, but there's a point I think where I, I do my personal work with my own rituals, my own practices, but there are other times when I like to be with a group. Like if I'm going to a Beltane celebration for a large community where I know there are going to be multiple, you know, people with multiple sets of practices and traditions, I'm comfortable. And I think, you know, especially if nobody's driving one particular one down your throat. I, I have a problem with Wicca. I may never have become a Wiccan because of the usual, the very common perfect love, perfect trust. And I was, and they explained to me, so, well, that's only within circle. And I said, I don't trust these people. I don't know these people. You have, I have to know somebody before I can trust them. And I said, well, it's just for the purposes of, it's like, I also don't lie if I can help it. And so mm -hmm. I'm not going to claim to have perfect love and perfect trust with a bunch of strangers that yeah. many of them seem like kooks to me. <laughs> so um, that's probably the why I never, I never joined. And then there's the whole thing we see of witch wars. Oh God, we've all wars. been through witch wars. <laughs> you want to you want to go into that? Maybe we should have a separate whole, whole thing. Uh, no, yeah, no, but we've all yeah, been. I there, don't know right? about this. This is uh, well. How, oh, you how don't about know about witch wars? How, how about the short summary readers digest large print version so that we understand no. the concept? Lois like that one. Go for it. Or do you want me to do it? So, well, no, I'm asked. I know nothing about this, so yeah. I'm sure. in the same Which, Which comes in? Who? You're gonna do it? Obviously, yeah. we're everyone no, now. <laughs> see, this witch knows what she's doing, has power, can do it, and another witch who wants to be the leader wants to undercut them and throw them out and basically blast them to hell because they want the power to control a group. Oh, oh. that. All right. Oh, oh boy, it's like that's the little tin god syndrome. Gangsters and it, it's not oh, unlike yeah. uh, it, you see it in in Boy Scouts and Girl Scout leaderships. So you see it in PTA. Oh, oh for God's yeah. sake! You see, this is all about anywhere you everything. gather three people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're talking about basic group dynamics. Yeah. Then, and add one, then add the paranoia of psychic attack. If yeah. you are in a population where they believe that some that, that somebody can hex you, uh, then anything that goes wrong in your life, you've been psychically attacked and then things get really out of hand. And it's yeah. not always psychically attacked. I mean, it can be a person who comes in into a group and they're open and it, you realize that somebody in the group who was used to control feels threatened by your knowledge or your ability and then goes through the group and comes around the backside to undercut you. And the next thing you know, 
or is threatened by your independence. <laughs> and the next thing you know, you're, you're, you've become the social outcast. And, you know, it's not a hexing thing because maybe the person who did it couldn't quite do that. But they manipulated other people. And, and there's a lot of, I see a lot of psychological manipulation going on in that to maintain control of groups. And that's one reason I go, I don't need this. I, I well, also maybe. have seen something I, more in the 70s and 80s than recently. But when Wicca was the dominant practice, we had uh, it, a coven was headed by a high priest and a high priestess. Yes. And they were almost always a romantic couple. And you know what happens to romantic couples? They <laughs> break up. And then when they break up, it's the friends are yours, mine, and there are no ours. They, they have, yes. and so the coven splits. And yeah. I think that the, the handicap of dealing with a congregation, if I can use that word, that has a, uh, that is based on a romantic couple, put witchcraft at, at a much higher risk of, of witch wars in that, yes. in that situation. Yes. And so, so again, another, another advantage of being a solitary. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I, mean, I realized that um, we, Jan and I, certainly we've been married for nearly 30 years now, but we're not in charge of anything. So I guess there isn't this big deal about it. So there's no <laughs> envy. I don't, you know, and I don't envy her what she can do. And I don't think she envies me for what I can do, even though we can both well, do things the other can't do. Yeah, we have complementary skills. So right we work together as a as a team and this is you know we're all hovering around the issues that have always repelled me from groups it's like jen said you get three people together and you know well <laughs> where two or three uh -huh. are gathered in my name there i am there am i among them but who is it that's among you but that's like Ooh, three, can keep a, three can it, keep a secret it, if two of them are dead so uh yeah. <laughs> Yep. But so yeah. I like the, the how do you identify your practice uh, as a topic? Um, I I've always had a hard time identifying my practice, other than I'm not that. When I talk to somebody, I can say, "Well, that's not exactly how I do it." Yeah, so, I just have to say I'm an eclectic solitary. Yeah, yeah. that's that sounds pretty good. Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely. people talk about. I have, Kitchen witch and cottage witch and all these other witches and what the heck? Well, I do a few of those things. Yeah, I do a lot of different things. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, people my always ask you what your tradition is, and so I said, okay, we are the uh, New England pagan. Uh, uh, we're the uh, <laughs> we're New England pagan peasant tradition is what I started calling ourselves. <laughs> you know, we had, I like we had it. a little farm. Yeah. MPPT. Yeah. Yeah, well, I haven't. I, I just like said, that. I'm sorry. I'm an eclectic solitary. I'm I'm homegrown. I I was just born this yeah. way and figured it out for myself. I'm right. homebrew. <laughs> and people yeah. look at me like you know. And that's the thing when you do that and when you admit that no, I wasn't blessed by a high priestess of this, that, or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, have you found that it in impacts how you are accepted or not accepted when you get into larger gatherings and groups where there are witches of various traditions, whether it's a heathenry thing over here, a Wiccan people over here, or this other thing over there. Do you find it hard to get your credibility? Yeah, I would bet that the ones who learned everything they know through a certain tradition feel like you somehow you're, you're faking it and you're cheating and trying to be, to be a wannabe because you made it up yourself. Right. And that's because they essentially what they did is they paid for theirs, maybe not in money, but in body and soul. And they're and insulted loyalty. and loyalty. Mm -hmm. And they're insulted at the thought that you might be able to do it and still retain your sanity and independence. Yeah. Yeah. Then that's part of it is your threat. Yeah. I'm kind of used to that. Anytime you're better than anybody. <laughs> at, at, well, you know, it's like when I was a high tech test engineer. I remember one day, turned the corners, walking down the aisle towards my cube, and I saw two or three of the developers 
talking. One of them looked up and said, "Uh oh, it's Bill. <laughs> and that's because I was the head of automated testing. And I was always the one, uh, Jeff, we got a problem with this new submit you just put in. So I was the threat in the sense that if you made a mistake, I would find it. And I would that this and I was finding things that only a technomage could find because it wasn't showing up necessarily in test results. But I would yeah. look at it and stare at it and I said, that smells like a driver bug. And you know, and now looking back, I, I was very much a technomage there. Because mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. I, they they regarded me with a certain amount of I don't know, fear, because, you know, <laughs> I, you know, even my bosses, it was like, how do you do this? So yeah. I don't know. I look at it and it tells me. Well, I guess yeah. looking back now, that's technomagery. So. So, yeah, so, I, I, I'm used to the fact that I tend to upset people's apple carts just by being what I am. And I bet everybody here in this window right now has had that same experience. Oh, yeah. In some way or another. Uh, Aisling, anyway, are you, you, you were, um, I, I, I remember that you came, you came in down in the Bible Belt. And then yes. you, you are now up in the New England area. No, I'm now, no, I'm in the D.C. area. Yeah, I'm I, in Northern um, Virginia. I, I got, I, I, I think that. That we are, you know, that, that's a lot easier to find, uh, find a community. Uh, up I here. think if you're in New England, it's much easier. The D.C. area is getting better. It has gotten better. Um, but the fact that I, I moved to northern Virginia around the D.C. area in 1980, and it still took me 26 more years to find mm -hmm. a community. And I and I yeah then I found out oh man navigating the communities is probably much more difficult than just doing it yourself. I mean it's <laughs> well, hey, hey, I'm old and I'm setting my ways. I'll admit it. Aisling, I, where in the Bible Belt uh, did you come? Uh, were you raised? Danville, Virginia. So okay, the, I think I'm a bit south of north, that. Then. It's right on the North Carolina line, 60 miles from Greensboro, where the famous 1964 sit-in at the Woolworths for protesting segregation, et cetera. We, it was a town at that time. It's a city that at that time in the city limits. And, and at the time in my very youth, it was between 25 and 30,000 people and had over 200 churches listed in the yellow pages. 70% of which were Baptist, 20% were Methodist. There was one Presbyterian church, one Catholic church, two Jewish synagogues, one Orthodox and one Reform, and uh, lots of independent Je Jehovah's Witnesses, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, no, no you Unitarians. Need, you don't have to go any further because... I'm living in High Point. Okay. Yep. You know it well. And then by the time I left, yeah, it was 50,000 people with 100,000 people in the greater metropolitan area in the county surrounding it that depended on their shopping and stuff for going there. And it hadn't changed. But there How actually is a Unitarian up? Church in Greensboro now. Woohoo! <laughs> how, how, how soon before you found a... Uh, a cult shop or a crystal shop or or a place where you could look for oh uh in the early 2000s wow i did you know it was just yeah uh, i i i remember we had up here uh our local big town uh one year had five witch shops <laughs> And of course, with that being, which indicates that we really needed one, yes. but when there were five, they drove each other out. Yeah. <laughs> they all, they all went, they all went away within a year. We had one that was here around in the late nineties, early two thousands out near here in Loudoun County. 
I didn't, I didn't continually dig and search for them. I mean, in, in downtown DC or anything, but I mean, occasionally you could find something like there would be a jewelry shop in Alexandria and you'd say, Oh, and it was a very pretty necklace and it had this nice crystal in it, but it was a standard artsy craftsy handmade jewelry shop. But most of the things were not, but every now and then you go, Oh, <laughs> this is meant for, you would find. I think that perhaps sometimes we get easier access to the pagan community uh, in science fiction and, uh, fandom and and SCA. Yeah. And I was oh, not yeah. in SCA. There, trust me, there was nobody in SCA down there. And I didn't find, I mean, I should have found it earlier, but I just didn't hit the path for some reason. I didn't make the context could have directed me towards some of those. And so, oh, well. Do you remember how they used to say that marijuana was a gateway drug? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I figured that Wicca is a gateway uh, religion that people find that Wicca was out there pushing, we have the right to be here and people could find them. And yes. then mm -hmm. they would, uh, you, you finally found somebody you didn't have to pretend that well, you were doing that. I didn't. Uh, was a great <laughs> relief, but then, then you spin off into heathenry or Egyptian witchcraft or, uh, or, or, or Hellenic witchcraft or what, or, or Strega or whatever, but yeah. You, it, you, but I, I I just look at, at Wicca as a as a gateway. Yes, mm -hmm. it's a great place to stay if that's what you're looking for. But God God is bless them for being out there in front and having the the witch uh, you know, pushing pushing to to for acceptance. And when I did finally meet the woman who is the Wiccan HPS three. She wanted to evaluate me and I had to read like a hundred books and she was going to interview me and decide whether I was worthy to become an initiate or a student. Well, you know, that, that attitude. And I was like, forget that. I've been doing this for more years than you have. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind I've, of funny I've been because... doing it longer than you've been alive. Yeah, yeah. really. One of that, the, that, I had that one too. Yes. Yeah. The heathen uh, group, one of them told me that, well, you can join our group, but you have to come in as a thrall. I said, excuse me. I know what a thrall is and no, I have, I know more than the three quarters of you here. I am not yes, going to spend do. a first year washing up your dishes so that you can tell me that, yes, I, you, you accept, you accept my level of knowledge. Screw that. Yeah. That's, that's pretty much my attitude. So I'm, you know, if I get that treatment, yeah. I just, so I keep, I keep thinking about to somebody Brings who, was very important to me 20 years ago because he got on my job as a high-tech engineer, but he he was Wiccan. Uh, you remember Andre Wood, Chip Oh Yeah, lo loved Andre. He had, uh, he, had, he had Wiccan parents. That was cool. Right, but I remember hearing somebody grump about the fact that he was too high church Wiccan. Yeah. And, <laughs> Well, That's a lovely yes. way of putting it. I get to get an image Can in my get mind. It, Ashling? Did, did, did that resonate with you? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, so. he, he was, um, how, nowadays, here we are in the 20s, and there are lots and lots of second and third degree, uh, third, third generation, sorry, not third degree, third right. generation uh, pagans out there. And mm -hmm. that wasn't going on in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s. In the oh, 80s, no. some of the early Wiccans that got in under Gardner in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, in the well, 80s. Yeah. Uh, but you still have this issue that, yeah, we've now, it's just like Skadians. You know, there, there were generations of Skadians. I remember. And personally, I'd love to. I'd love to join SCA, but. Yeah. <laughs> and I, no, I don't. You know, to, to, the, to this day, there are still children running around in the world. Who have no idea that I ever had an other name than Guillaume. Because no. that's why don't you ask why don't I, Jen? Yes. No, oh, oh, no, no I, I don't, don't ask anything. The reason I don't is because the only person I know in the quote kingdom we have down here, one of the big uh throws her weight around people is that same HPS3 that instructed her 11 year old daughter not to listen to me and did all the other stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And I just don't want to no, be in I, the I, 
where she's going to be FCA anymore because my body can't handle it. And my brain can't handle it. Yeah, she has physical and mental limits now. I'll stick to Ren Fair. I'll stick to Ren Fair and studying on my yeah. own. Can't uh, even do yeah, that. And, and okay. Besides, it's another group with its politics. Yes. And its own version of witch wars. Yes. And, and, and you Which know, is why I'm staying away. So, you know, we had fun. We did cool things. I got some awards and verified at least my early choice in the early 80s. Well, after they calibrated my first helmet and when my head stopped ringing, I said, <laughs> fighting was not for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't consider myself an artist, so I went into service. Yeah, so, and I considered myself an artist, so I kept doing artist things, but I wouldn't do... Well, when I first joined the SCA, it was fine not to do so authentically. But nowadays, they really want it all authentic, so they don't ap appreciate my sense of whimsy. Right. <laughs> and I have no interest in doing authenticity. It's sometimes quite hard to get whimsy into a pagan circle, too. You know, you know, and, and the funny thing about that, when you're talking about the SCA, aren't the last two letters creative anachronism? Yes, but to maintain their educational that's yeah, true. That, nonprofit yeah. group, the they, they, yeah, they the really do stress C3. the educational. Yeah, and they really do have to lean hard on the educational aspects. Yeah. You I know. never went to college. I don't know how to write the kind of documentation they're looking for these okay. days. Okay, Let, let's just say back let's, the topic. let's go back to, to witchcraft. And uh, yeah, I want please. to ask, do you please, consider please. yourself more of a see uh, a uh, spiritual witch or or a the traditional magic user witch because people often make that distinction yes they do really i mean oh, yeah. i i am i got a foot in each bucket mm -hmm. I, I very much the the spiritual that path but also the bold power slinging you betcha hmm. <laughs> If you want somebody who can sling energy, yes, sir, Bob. <laughs> and that's important. I mean, I think I think all groups, whether you're druids or whether you're witches or what, whatever you are, what, or you're cunning men, you you're still manipulating energy. I have a feeling that the parapsychologists are doing it. Part part of why we have changing times, changing worlds. Can we mm. please get past the vocabulary and start talking to each other? Uh, but. Uh, it, the, it's the communication. Once we are caught up in the words, it's hard. Here you are, you're a solitary. And I think that the question that, that we were discussing, you know, privately on, in chatting was, what do you do when you have spent an entire full life? I'm 70. Or, I, I think you're in your 60s. Yeah, I'm 67, almost 67 and a half. So uh, when you have gone through your life collecting all of the skills and information, what not to mention the stuff? Do, mm. What do you do? <laughs> and the stuff, yeah. What do you, what do you do when you haven't got a protege? When you haven't got apprentices? When you haven't got someone who you've been training and passing your information on to? Or when you're not a P oh when you're not a part of a group that can help? Yeah, help if pass you're it a solitary. And yeah, that, that's it. Oh, Janine wanted to say Janine. something. That's, I was going to say volunteering. Like, I get very involved with the nonprofits here in Maine. <clears throat> and what that does is puts me in community so I can share stories in different places. I've also created circles so people can come. Um, if you build it, they will come. And I mean, here we are here. It was built, so I am here. Yes. It is hard to do it. There is not the apprentice kind of thing, though I do mentor a couple of people. Um, you know, this is, we in the new age of being able to Zoom, and I have learned a lot by being here. I think this is a great way to share knowledge. You know, some write books, some create art. Um, but really, for me, I put myself out into the nonprofit pagan world here in Maine and community volunteering and mm -hmm. that I find to be a hub of ability to share some of that wisdom 
And what kind of community groups? I mean, where can you where what community groups are there that allow you to speak freely about witchcraft or paganism or whatever well, we without have, getting blasted off out of the group? Well, we've created a couple of pagan nonprofits here in Maine. Oh, great. Right. We have the Maine Pagan Clergy Association um, and the Maine Pagan Alliance. So there are a couple nonprofits. Um, to try to keep the state and different groups tied together. So at least we know they exist. That's the trick. At least we know they exist so we can send people that way. And it is hard to get involved as a pagan in, in most volunteering. But I always pictured myself as the silver haired woman sitting and knitting in church. But my church is the pagan church. So I've had to actually help create that and whatever that looks like. And we have another hand raised. One of our UU churches in Maine allows for um, pagan practitioners to use their space. Yeah, most of the ones here do too. Mm. Unitarians are very good. Most of the Unitarian churches in this area, they do have a cups or a pagan group. But outside of that, but then again, finding a place to pass. I mean, I'm looking at, Maybe the way to pass what I've learned over the last, geez, over 50 years of doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I need to sit down and start writing it down. And write. I mean, I looked at it and now my whole book of shadows is on the computer and I print it out and it's, in a, it's pretty much filling up a four inch binder mm -hmm. at this point. That's I a have a 10 year old granddaughter you can borrow. She absorbs all information. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And it so maybe, is, yeah, maybe I want to write a book. Maybe I want to do this. What, which things do I want to pass along? Obviously certain spells I wouldn't pass along because they could be very damaging and they may, they may be aimed at specific in circumstances. So I pull those out, but do I, should I write a book explaining what I've learned over the years? I don't know. And then there's still the problem of the stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely Ooh. certain that a, that a book about distributing the stuff might not be eagerly snapped up in the <laughs> aging population we have now. Do you know that there are now more millennials than there are baby boomers alive? Oh, yeah. And yeah. so, so we, we're dying off. And as we die off, the question is, how do you keep your book of shadows out of the yard sale? Yes. Mm -hmm. There's a title for your book. That's, that's one. <laughs> that, that's and, a good uh, concept. And bef before, before somebody takes that particular crystal that did something and puts it on the thing, uh, who's going to cleanse it and decharge it? Or are you going to find a person to pass it to who knows what it is and how to use it that you would trust mm -hmm. to keep it and use it? Yeah, certainly or this, the stuff seems to be more of an of issue that way. that's connected to something. How do you make sure? Because I found when I use when I use physical tools and magic, it not only helps me direct my energy and maybe helps me focus it, but it also absorbs energy and retains it. Mm -hmm. And yep. anybody who picks it up has a chance of, of actually releasing some of that energy out into the world. Right. The other well, thing too, there's a big question about tarot cards. Mm. Oh, my, my 21 tarot decks. <laughs> well, that's why when Jen started doing tarot, she was about the only person I was willing to give my decks to. But I think about not only your stuff, but knowledge. You are in yes, the past. That's the and the thing. first thing that comes to mind is what do you even want to pass on? Because uh, we're a long way from the days when a lifetime of experience was worth passing on to the next generation who are probably going to experience similar things. Now, the way the world has changed, I'm turned back more to never mind techniques and specific things attitudes, uh, ways of looking at the world. That seems a lot more important because we're, we're on this roller coaster that it seems to getting steeper every day. And if I wanted to help 
a young person learn anything, it would be, how do you deal with this change? So how do you apply your magic to it? How do you use your magic to keep yourself sane in a world that I cannot forecast for you? And how about Janine had something to say too. Yeah, there was um, a hand. going back to sharing the wisdom and how to share that video and podcasts are where the younger people go, you know, not just mm. books like oh, we yeah. can share it through Excellent. lectures Wait. and recordings. Um, yes. We just started the Maine Pagan History Project to record our elders and stories here in the state because it is important. We have with experience have the wisdom of when this thing went bad. Here, let me tell you about when the thing went bad, right? And those are important stories just as much as how the thing went good. Mm. Yeah. And going to um, physical objects as, you know, workers, we do have a responsibility for those things. And some of those things are written into, you know, the wishes of my death. And a few of my other powerful friends have been told to make sure you take care of my implements, including my body, you know, that those things are powerful. And that is, um, that is, yeah. Here's a question for you. With all of the books that are out on the market, are there any you have come across that are particularly good or particularly bad for someone who wants to be a solitary? I've seen a few, yeah. <laughs> I'd have to go. I'd have to go look at the bookshelf and pull that one off and say this is one. But there, uh, there is one. Um, there are a couple that are people who are very like tightly spacey and had and it's like really, <laughs> yeah. They, but there are a few of my look. It's like and I, 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 I have a particular author in mind, but I don't want to say it and I don't know the books, but. Yeah, you know, there are some. Of course, I would not. Um, I would not recommend Uncle Bucky's book to anybody as a good starting point. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that. But y- you really have to just weed through them and read between the lines and everything. But while we're on the topic, something that um, Griffin br- brought up with the way the world and society is changing, especially in the last few weeks, what we have seen happen. And I'll yeah just say with the way between our political system, between Congress and the Supreme Court and everything is going on. Uh, what do we feel like is the threat to a witch or pagan community and what can we do to help shelter and protect? And because, I mean, let's face it, these millennials or whatever are coming along and they're used to an open world, whether it's LGBTQ or whether it's witchcraft, wherever. And they, they're on Twitter and they're on Instagram and they're on that. How do you protect yourself if there's a backlash? Cause those of us who grew up solitary because we faced the backlash of a community, how can we help? Teach people how to protect themselves so that one day you walk in and find out you're fired for being a witch. And that is a growing possibility, I believe. Yes, it is. And so, yeah, I mean, that that topic wasn't on what we discussed originally, Chippecom, but it just came up to me in the last couple of days. Yeah, I I am, um, I'm going to ask again for, for a little show of hands because um I, I would like to, to lean on Ashlyn. Uh, to, I would like to, to get her to do a workshop on, um, on the pre-death or, or, or maybe a panel if you want to invite other people in to, just be, to do it with you for, for changing times, changing worlds. I'd like to do more of this. This, is, this strikes me as a really important thing. And um, if we can find, if you want co-panelists to, to do it at, but it, show of hands, who would like this uh, as a, as, as a um, hit your reaction button, uh, if, you, if you'd like to see this as a panel or a workshop at the, in November. All right, what is the short description of the topic? 
yeah. basically getting getting our um, how well I, I'm going to go back to my description how to keep your book of shadows out of the yard sale how yeah. how to make sure that your stuff is not that they recognize because that okay. strikes me as that is dealt with by appropriate I also people. like the other half of how do you pass on your knowledge I think was it I mean, both of those are my concerns. And what do you do as you're getting through this point? How do you pass on your knowledge? And how do you pass on your stuff appropriately? I think the blog, the, the blog posts, I think she's got a very good point. That that's how people learn these days. Yeah. On to YouTube. Uh, <laughs> isn't this wonderful? We get to do it when we've gotten old and wrinkled. <laughs> Hey, look, everybody was was young. I, I I served once as the crone in a wedding ceremony when I was 43 because I was the oldest pagan they knew at the time. <laughs> and so, okay. yeah, oh. it's, it's kind of absurd, but uh yeah, now we're now we're actually getting some real crones out there. So yeah. Uh and, as and someone who I, has I, no great. descendants, I mm -hmm. As someone who has no descendants, there is not another generation of my family. Same no. here. I have no I, children. It, it's a very cringy subject for me, thinking about what the heck do we I do with a, all our stuff. Yeah, I'm an only child, and I don't have any children. So what, what do you do when you're facing the fact you know, we go into uh, this whole business I've talked so much about, about preparing for death? How do you prepare for the death of your lineage? You know? That's another. Ooh, I am not a mentor to anybody. Uh, that I, was stung, didn't it, Chippecon? Yeah. I I actually had a very fortunate experience um, up until last end of last summer. For 19 years, I had been a project leader for a non ownership 4 H sheep club, and so over those 19 years, I had. 43 different kids, usually for five or six years at a time or more, and usually five or, you know, going through for five or six years for each kid, usually anywhere from three to eight at my farm in any given year. And there were three or four of them who we really bonded and who uh, still come back and visit me now. They're off in college or they graduated from college. They come back and, you know, it's, it's great. And I'm kind of like the honorary aunt or whatever. <laughs> and they say, oh yeah, you helped raise me. And yep. it's that kind of thing. And I, I have to laugh. A couple of them are kind of some of my potential people to pass on to. I've at least opened them up to what I do. I didn't dare tell them until they were 18 because I didn't want to get hauled in for contributing to the delinquency of a minor or something like right. that. Mm -hmm. So, but I, so it, it was really a very do. funny thing, which you'll, you'll all enjoy. I'll have to take a minute. When we'd be out working on the farm sessions on weekends, where they'd be here for a couple of three hours on a Sunday afternoon, and usually somebody had to go to the bathroom. Well, the, you go through it, you come in the house, you go to the sunroom, you go through the sunroom, you pass the steps up to the loft, and the loft is where I have my altar and all my center of my practice. So the energy just kind of like pulsates to the and bathroom and they knew something was up there mm. and they go and they get to the point and i and i would feel like a, okay i need to go pull them out there they're trying to and i'd get there they said finally they when they found out after they were 18 and i let them go up there and i told them what i did and i let them see it and they were like well we said you know we always try i said yes i know you said how did you always know they were posting lookouts so that <laughs> See when I was coming, they were trying to sneak up there and I'd always get there before yeah. they could. Now we know how you knew. <laughs> yes, I was attached to that space. And I knew when they were doing it, and I'd come back. And they, they're like, no wonder we couldn't get up there successfully. It was very entertaining. That's great. <laughs> Ashling, I one of the things I note, if you did that much for that many young people during that period of time then you've left a legacy and you have kids. Yeah. Yes, I do. 
not not biological kids, but and there's some of them no. I will share some of my stuff with. The actually, spiritual connection that you've done something that changed their lives more profoundly than any aspect of their biology. And you know, if you got to leave that, that's that's thank what you. I'm trying to leave behind. Oh, well, thank you. And one of the one of the girls, actually now young woman, um, is she is now she's actually becoming kind of a pagan in a way she is looking for <laughs> uh she is now i think looking at artemis and she's got and i have given i have taken and given her a couple of my tools and things to set her out mm -hmm. and work with her so i have made that one progress with that one young woman but hey <laughs> it, it it's interesting my situation is that i have come into all this very late years and years after having been diagnosed with all these disabilities that have made it impossible for me to do much of anything. I never had kids. My, none of my family had kids. I have little social life because I just can't get out and about where other people are. I have nowhere to go with any of this except do what I can at home and do what small kindnesses I can when I'm out and about. Um, we went to a doctor's appointment today and we're able to help a woman bring in huge coats of food meals yeah. that were bought this, for the nurses at some in one of the offices yeah there was this huge food delivery for staff and this for poor ems woman, week uh, our heroes week and our heroes week and this poor woman did heroes. not have a, have enough arms to cap so i don't know who was with her it's just uh there were two doctors and yeah. i said here let, let, let me give you a hand with that and you know, she and we helped her load them into the elevator and then back off again. And, and I said, "Okay, you're so on we did your that own where now. we could, you know? right? Little things like but that." Generally speaking, not only do I not have well, I mean, I have the venues if I want them, but I don't have the ability to do very much with them. I have been able to do a panel, a, a talk for Otherworldly. I may do another one for the conference, but I feel rather lost when it comes to trying to pull together the energy a lot of the time to do much of anything that will be a lasting legacy yeah and this is why it gets kind we, of we are not all so authors <laughs> not, well, not everyone has to write a book yeah but uh, i would like to actually i yeah i want to i think i should write so uh, when i make myself doing it it's, uh, it's time for the wrap up the the comments were yes. there any points you wanted to hit that we have not hit tonight? I, I hope just want to say you. Oh, that I think talking about being a solitary is really important, especially for the seekers, knowing that that is okay. And I really support people in finding their own confidence. I'm not telling you how to do it. You figure out Excellent. how you do it. And I will support you in that. So it is an important yeah. conversation. Yeah. Thank you for hosting us. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's incredibly important to get that kind of validation. Because just like when I realized somewhere along the line that I didn't have to join a Buddhist monastery or even go to the... Uh, <laughs> Zen Center in Syracuse and sit every day, which is a world class center. Oh, yeah, we got a top notch Zen Center here. Okay. But the anyway, idea I, that anyway. maybe I could be more efficient or what, but no, it's good okay. to know that you can do it alone. Then I, I do want to thank Ash, Ashley. <laughs> uh, <laughs> working on it. I'll okay. get there. I, I, I am a reader. I have learned to mispronounce many, many names and, and words <laughs> because I only ever heard them. Uh, I only ever read them in my head. So I'm pleased to, to, to know how to pronounce your name now. <laughs> um, but it is one, Scott, it's Gaelic. It's Scott Gaelic. It I, I hope we can oh, okay. convince you and maybe find whatever support you need to continue this conversation uh, at the conference. 
I will mention if, if that everybody want if everybody wants it, if there's value, people want it, I'll be happy to do it. I, oh, I yeah. think that we oh, have yeah. a lot of people who do. The conference is coming up uh, in November. Okay. It's going to be mm -hmm. virtual because uh, of the pesky way the the virus is mutating. Um, November seventh to twenty third. Uh, try that again. Will be done in the <laughs> November seventh to the. Did I say 23rd? 7th to the 13th. Thank yes. you. Okay. <laughs> scared Lois half to death with that one. Weekday, yeah, evenings, okay. weekday sure. evening sessions and then all day weekend sessions. Hey, right. I just had to schedule That's a exactly around yeah. it. Thank now. you. That's what I was going to say. And the res <laughs> reservation registration is open now. And if you have, I'm going to put into the chat. So now the, do I have uh, to write a proposal? <laughs> yes, you have. Yeah, there's a, there's a, uh, <laughs> now, look, it's it's a, just a form to fill out on on the website. Okay, that, that's it. it's and easy. I've done it. What you have to so, decide is what you well, would rather do. As yeah, the first thing I want to know: Do the people in here think I could contribute value and it's worth it? And I'm not oh. just a good yes. presenter. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I think oh, yeah. yes. a unanimous I'm very vote eager there. for this. So, uh, I'm going to stop the recording now, and uh, I'm put, putting in the link for, so people can. Don't forget to capture the, the chat. Yes. Show their yeah. Save your chat and. Uh, now how do you save your chat? How